Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. On this, the second Sunday of Easter, our worship for the Diocese of Caledonia comes from St. Andrew's Cathedral in Prince Rupert on their traditional and unceded territory of the Shimshan people. I want to thank the Parish of the North Peace who helped put together today's service of Easter Lessons and Carols. Our worship is one where we will reflect on the Word of God spanning all of Scripture and salvation history. As we reflect on Doubting Thomas and his willingness to believe because he had seen and how that affects our faith. So, with doubts, with resolve, and with the joy of this Easter season, while we are the church separate but together, let us gather for our time of worship today. My sisters and brothers, as we celebrate Christ rising from the dead, let us call the whole universe to share our joy, heaven and earth, men, women, children, mountains, prairies, oceans, rivers, birds and beasts, wild and tame. Everything that moves, stands, grows, or sits still. Out of the darkness has come light, out of bittersweet, out of evil, good. For, ever, for evil scatters, shame runs away, innocence blooms once more. We sing in our chains, we embrace in our fear, we kneel in deep quietude, we thrill in stillness. As we hear the story of our salvation, speech fails. In silence and in music, let us bring before the source of life and light our awe and wonder, our joy and laughter, our thanks and praise, our everlasting adoration. We sing our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. The first lesson. The first lesson is written in the book of Genesis, beginning in the first chapter at the first verse. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, 
The earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing our next hymn, Yours the Hand That Made Creation. The second lesson is written in the book of Exodus, beginning in the 14th chapter at the 19th verse. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground. The waters formed a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the water after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord, in the pillar of fire and cloud, looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon the chariots, the chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea and the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing, Let All Things Now Living.
lesson is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, beginning in the 35th chapter at the first verse. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, Be strong, do not fear, here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveller, not even fool, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The word of the Lord. We sing all for a thousand tongues to sing. The fourth lesson. The fourth lesson is written in the book of the prophet Zephaniah, beginning in the third chapter at the fourteenth verse. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion, shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you, he has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion, do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness, he will renew you in his love, 
He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. At that time I will bring you home, at the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing, How Firm a Foundation. The fifth lesson is written in the first book of Peter, beginning in the first chapter, at the third verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into the inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith, for the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, though perishable, is be tested by fire. Your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with the indescribable and glorious joy. Through him you have come to rest and trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are set on God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
lesson is written in Paul's letter to the Colossians, beginning in the third chapter at the first verse. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness and patience. Bear with one another and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of the Lord. We sing that great Irish hymn, Be Thou My Vision. The Seventh Lesson The Seventh Lesson is written in the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning in the 28th chapter, at the first verse. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, 
and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing, There is a Redeemer. The Eighth Lesson The Eighth Lesson is written in the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning in the 28th chapter, at the 16th verse. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing, Lord, you give the Great Commission.
lesson is written in the Gospel according to John, beginning in the 20th chapter at the 19th verse. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The Word of the Lord. We sing, Thine be the glory.
welcome, and I'm glad that I could be speaking with you today. My name is the Reverend Emma Vickery, and I am the rector of St. Matthew's in Terrace and Christ Church in Kitimat. <clears throat> Let us pray. Lord, I just ask that you, with every person and their own personal devices this day, that you come and speak to them in ways that they never expected, that you will shine your light upon them this day and always. Amen. <clears throat> this passage um, of Thomas always reminds me, actually, of a dog we had. It was a dog um, that my parents received when I was just in university. Um, the poor dog had been abandoned on the side of the ro road and then picked up by my grandmother. And then, then she wasn't able to take care of it anymore, so it was given to my cousin. And then my cousin traveled um, across an ocean to my parents' house, which they hadn't seen him in years, without any warning. He just showed up with this dog and said, no one wants to take care of it. This poor dog, this poor dog. Um, we had the other dog who was kind of wild. Um, she would bolt at any moment. She would run after every person and every car that went by. But this other dog would literally hit our heels, trying to make sure that we were always there, safe. Make certain that he was always with us. And his name, of all names, was Thomas. And we nicknamed, nicknamed him Poor Thomas. He said, oh, poor Thomas, poor Thomas, poor Thomas who would cry when we went around and we were going for a walk and we went around <clears throat> the stretch of road and he'd just see us around the bushes and then suddenly we were gone and he would cry miserably because he felt he was abandoned. Poor Thomas. There are so many commentaries that you read about Thomas, and it's about how he had this lack of faith, and how he was one of those particular people who um, kind of got a bad rap, I believe. I think that Thomas was right on in his skepticism, and right on in his life. <clears throat> Yet, you know, he was left out. And the reading today talks about how that it was a week after Jesus appears to the other disciples that Thomas sees him. Can you imagine what that week must have been like for Thomas? You know, all of the disciples are ecstatic and excited that they've seen the Lord. They've seen Jesus. He came amongst them and, and blessed them all. And they would be talking about how exciting it was. And then Thomas would come into the room and then there would be a quiet hush and they'd all kind of start whispering because, well, Thomas wasn't there. Poor Thomas. Poor Thomas. A whole week of wondering and wondering why wasn't he special enough to see the Lord? Why did all these other people get to see the Lord and he wasn't? special enough and then he does <clears throat> he sees the lord and it's and he wants to see the lord like i think that it's so special that thomas wants it for himself he doesn't just take the words of other people but he wants a real and life-giving encounter with the risen Lord. And he waits for that. He waits for that moment. And in that moment, he has the best and the most profound proclamation of faith. My Lord and my God. It's one of the most articulate expressions of faith from all of the disciples at that moment. I really believe sometimes that there is a bit of a misunderstanding in our culture about faith, that faith conquers doubt. But these gos this gospel reading today 
teaches us that faith and doubt are, in fact, closely woven together. Doubt and questioning, oh right, skepticism, aren't the opposite of faith, but sometimes an essential ingredient. Hebrews 11 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Thomas enters the community of faith, but openly voices his doubts. And the truth of the matter is, is it gives us all permission to come into our communities and doubt in the same way. Jesus' words for us today, every single person who has tuned into this broadcast, is because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who did not see and yet believed. That is going generations upon generations after the disciples, which includes and wraps around all of us. Blessed are those who believe but have not seen. The first Russian astronaut went up into space and the first thing they asked him when he came down from space was, did you see God? And he said, no, I didn't see God. So the newspaper the next day had the headline, astronaut proves God doesn't exist. Across the world, the first American astronaut went up into space and they asked the same question. And his response was, I would have seen God if I had stepped out of my space suit. Same question, different responses. People have forever wanted to set out to disprove Christianity, disprove the resurrection of the Lord. <clears throat> In the 18th century, a man named Gilbert West set out to disprove the resurrection and he became a believer. In the 19th century, a general of the name of Lewis Wallace wanted to damage the church and set out to disprove the resurrection of our Lord and became a believer and wrote just a small fiction called Ben-Hur. In the 20th century, a lawyer and journalist in the name of Frank Morrison wanted to shatter Christianity. And so he knew how to research because he was a journalist and he had had this background but he was also a lawyer, so he knew how to take that material and change it for his liking. He also became a believer and wrote a book called Who Would, Who Moved the Stone? Who Moved the Stone? In the 21st century, a journalist named Lee Strobel also set out to disprove Christianity and found so much convincing evidence that he has written several books about the resurrection, about faith, God, and even creation. If you are a skeptic and you're a doubting, uh, and doubting, I would suggest you go out to try and disprove Christianity. You might just have a bestseller in your midst. But here we are with Thomas, openly doubting, openly being a skeptic in the midst of his community, which gives us all that same permission to have our doubts and our concerns. <clears throat> um, when I was younger, being a priest, it's surprising to know that my father wasn't a Christian. He didn't come from a Christian home. He actually, it were, his family often was quite against Christianity. And so when he was younger, um, some Methodists came to their house at the summertime and said, everybody on the hill that he lived were welcome to come to a church camp. And they said that they would pay for them. So although his parents were not Christian and they didn't really like Christianity, they thought, wow, I can get my son out of our house for a month in the summer and not have to pay a dime, he can go. And half of the kids in that on that hill also went to this camp. And at the very end of the camp, 
They asked anybody who wants to become a believer and who wants to open their hearts to Jesus Christ. It's an altar call, which I know us Anglicans don't always understand. But nonetheless, he stood up. He stood up and he asked Jesus into his heart that fateful summer when he was just a boy. And when he sat down, his best friend, his neighbor, said to him, why in the world did you do that? Now you're going to become one of them. With several explicitives I am not going to share with you. My dad was so embarrassed, he just forgot the incident. He put it out of his mind and went on with his life as though he was not a Christian, that he never did that. Years later, after meeting my mother, becoming a Christian, being baptized when I was 11, becoming an avid Sunday school teacher, my father was at a Bible study and it just hit him like a ton of bricks. He remembered that moment in time as a boy when he asked Jesus into his heart, a moment in which he had forgotten out of embarrassment. And he saw the way in which God had led him in his entire life, leading him to my mom, leading him to a believer, leading him in his faith journey. Sometimes when we doubt and we're skeptic and we question things, these things are all good things. They make us have a truer and deeper faith. And we are much like Thomas wanting our own encounters with the living God, our own personal encounters with the living God. And the truth is, is that is for everyone. Every person who watches this, every person out there who asks for a true and powerful encounter with the living God, the resurrected Jesus, it is for them. I just wanted to mention one more thing that I found powerful about this reading. Jesus appears with his scars. It reminds us that some marks of loss and pain and trauma, they leave marks. Maybe this is what we are looking for after the triumph celebration of Easter, even more so this year. We want to experience the real Lord in the messiness of our life. I appreciate Thomas and his longing for a personal encounter with the living God, a man who went sell for someone else's experience of the resurrection, but stuck around in hope of having his own. It is a beautiful story of how Jesus met Thomas right where he was. And that is the same message for all of us. It's okay to waver. It's okay to take our time. It's okay to hope for more. When Thomas doubts, met Jesus' wounds, New life erupted, faith blossomed, and the community grew. Be yourselves. Be true to who you are. And the living God will meet you there. And when you meet God's wounds, faith will erupt. Community will blossom and grow just as the spring flowers that we all get to see. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, I, I pray for each person who hears this message, that you will meet them in their isolation. You will meet them in their homes. They will meet them as they walk and they see the beauty of your world and the delicate flowers that poke their heads out after winter that they will see you in the people they meet. And even if it's online and a message or a phone call, that they will know in every person that they meet that you are with them. And in the quietness of the night, when they feel alone, come to them and show them your presence in a way that they never expected or imagined. Bring a resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, a personal encounter with you. In your holy, precious name, Lord Jesus Christ, amen.
Our offertory hymn today is Hail the Day That Sees Him Rise. During this pandemic, we do encourage you to continue your tithe support of your local parish through direct debit, posted checks, or online donations. Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, for ever and ever. All that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. All things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. Let us confess our baptismal faith as we say together, 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, God invites us to bring our doubts and fears, our joys and concerns, our petitions and praise, and offer them for the earth and all its creatures. In joy and hope, let us pray to the source of all life, saying, Hear us, Lord of glory. Hear us, Lord of glory. That our risen Savior may fill us with the joy of his holy and life-giving resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That isolated and persecuted churches may find fresh strength in the Easter gospel, especially remembering Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, Linda Nichols, our primate, Melissa Skelton, our metropolitan, and David Lehman, our bishop. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That he may grant us humility to be subject to one another in Christian love. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That he may provide for those who lack food, work, or shelter. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That by his power, Wars and famines may cease through all the earth. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That he may reveal the light of his presence to the sick, the weak, and the dying. That they may be comforted and strengthened. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That he will hear our prayers for those who have asked us to pray for them. For those we name now, let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That he will be with all those suffering with the COVID virus, as well as the frontline workers and their families. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory that he may send the fire of the Holy Spirit upon his people, that we may bear faithful witness to his resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. Receive these prayers, O God, and transform us through them, that we may have eyes to see and hearts to understand not only what you do on our behalf, but what you call us to do so that your realm will come to fruition in glory. Amen. The Collect for this day, together let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we, who have not seen, have faith and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, and in the language we choose, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our thanks to everyone who assisted with our worship today. For the parish in the North Peace who brought the idea forward and did most of the legwork. To our readers, Avis from the Cathedral and Prince Rupert, Grace from Hazelton, Stella in Fraser Lakes, our preacher, the Reverend Emma Vickery from Terrace Kitimat, and for Marjorie, our intercessor from Kitimat. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, work in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Our closing hymn today is On Our Way Rejoicing. Alleluia. Let us go forth with our belief strengthened. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.